Happy Wednesday, everybody. Huge confession today. You probably know this if you know anything about me, but I used to support the gays. I was very pro-LGB. If you knew me back in high school, if you knew me in college, you would have been like, yeah, Candace, that Candace girl, she supports the gays, the lesbians, the bi's. I had no issue with it. And it's really interesting because I am now shooketh to my core a tweet that Matt Walsh sent last week. Oh my gosh, I can't believe what I have just learned. We're going to go backwards so that we can understand the forward and realize how I was brainwashed. I was brainwashed by something called the Laramie Project. Do you remember that? Let's talk about that. Plus, later on in the show, it's debate time. The first Republican debate. Who are you excited to watch? Vivek and DeSantis are finally going to meet. And all my suspicions are Vivek will perform very well. Let's talk about that and much more today coming up on Candace Owens. Color me shocked. Color me shooketh to my core. Matt Walsh just does a lot of tweeting sometimes. He just says random things. And something caught my eye, which he said that I had no idea about, and maybe you did, but I did not. He essentially said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the entire story about Matthew Shepard and the Laramie Project was complete and utter crap. Now, let me tell you something about my high school upbringing. When I was in high school, there was a very sustained effort, which I now am recognizing may have been a propagandist effort, to get us talking about lesbian and gay issues. And the way that this was done was that our drama production, our drama club, put on a production, rather, of the Laramie Project. And in classes, we talked about exactly who was behind this storytelling. We talked about the story of Matthew Shepard and what was communicated to me, as well as all of us who were forced to go down to the auditorium and watch this play that was put on, was that a young gay boy was callously murdered out in Laramie, Wyoming. Why? Because he was gay. And it wasn't your average murder either. He was chained to a fence and left to die. And this spawned a national conversation about gay people being attacked, about homophobia, a necessary conversation about why it is that people can't just exist and be gay without being killed in America. How sad. You can imagine how emotionally impacted I was by the story. This was a young Candace. I was a lot softer than I am now. And I thought, how could people be okay with this? Why aren't we all using our platforms to speak out on behalf of gay people who just want to love his love? That's what I thought. I thought Matthew Shepard just wanted to love his love. I couldn't see how any human being could not stand behind this and want legislation to be pushed forward to protect these people from, yup, hate crimes. Simply being killed because of an attribute of yourself, like being gay. So I'm going to refresh your memory in case you aren't familiar with the story, in case you didn't have the same propaganda efforts launched upon you while you were in high school. Here is the story as it took place. On the evening of October 6th, 1998, Matthew Shepard went to Fireside Bar, a local hangout that was purportedly gay-friendly. Again, this took place in Laramie, Wyoming. It was karaoke night, and the locals rubbed shoulders with workers, calling in for a swift drink on their way home. Shortly after, two young men by the name of Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney arrived. The three men chatted briefly before leaving the bar and getting into a truck belonging to McKinney's father. In that truck, Matthew, Matthew Shepard, this is the gay young man, was robbed of his keys, his wallet, and his shoes, and beaten repeatedly by one or both of these men. He was then taken from the truck, pistol whipped up to 18 times on the head, and kicked between the legs. Matthew was then tied to a fence, set on fire, and left unconscious. Fifteen hours after the attack, a student was out riding his bike when he discovered Matthew Shepard tied to the fence, barely alive. He initially mistook him for a scarecrow. Matthew's face was covered in blood, aside from tear tracks on each side of his cheeks. Now, to be clear, Matthew eventually died, and you can imagine what sort of a conversation this sparked across the nation. It's horrific, and this is this really happened. This is actually a true telling of the events. He he was killed. And for years, and after a sustained effort, we were told that he was killed simply because he was gay, except it turns out that that wasn't the truth at all. That was the media spin, and it was 
quite the spin. Now, let me just explain to you the impact of this story and this play uh, amongst the national conversation and legislation. There were politicians, there were celebrities, they all pledged their support and their funding to combat, you guessed it, anti-gay hate crimes. The Shepard family themselves, obviously the devastated parents of this young boy, became campaigners for gay rights. Their names were Judy, and their names are, pardon, Judy and Dennis Shepard, and they now run the very successful Matthew Shepard Foundation, which funds educational programs and online community for teenagers to discuss their sexual orientation and gender issues. The Laramie Project was not the only play that was produced to tell this story. There were also numerous documentaries, dramas, books, and events that were put together based on what we were led to believe was a wholly true story. The men that were responsible for his death were convicted of first degree murder and given two life sentences. By the way, as they should have been, you killed somebody, you chained them to a fence, you set them on fire and left them to die. I don't have a problem with the sentencing of these two horrific individuals. They were not, however, charged with a hate crime because no such idea of a hate crime existed under Wyoming's criminal law, but because of people talking about the story and because of people wanting to put it in front of Congress, eventually President Obama signed the Matthew Shepard Act in 2009, a law which defined certain attacks motivated by victim identity as hate crimes. So yes, this is a lot of progress that took place for gay rights because of the Matthew Shepard story. I'm going to show you, by the way, just a trailer for the Laramie Project, the play that was eventually put on at my school, which made me believe that I had to become an advocate for gay rights when I was in high school. Take a listen, it's very emotional. Laramie is a beautiful town, it's secluded. Now, after Matthew, we're a town defined by a crime. And you're gonna use our words? I've never done anything like this before. How do you get people to talk to you? What do you ask? I seen what appeared to be a young man who was bound to the bottom of the pole. The perpetrators themselves were kids, local kids. That certainly offends us. They wanted to teach him a lesson not to come on to straight people. We don't grow children like that here. Well, it's pretty clear we do grow children like that here. I should have known. These guys should not have been talking to that guy. Hate crime's a hate crime. You murder somebody, you hate them. I don't know. This is America. Love the person for who they are, but condemn them for what they do. Some people are going to be sent to hell. And I think you know who you are. Someone needs to stand toe to toe with him and show the difference. What's come out of it? So you get it. Hate is not a Laramie value. Obviously, this person was killed because people couldn't deal with his identity as a gay man. So it was thought, at least, by many individuals, including myself, until a young man named Stephen Jimenez came around who spent 13 years of his life interviewing more than 100 people that were connected to this case. And landed himself in some hot water after he published his findings in a book called The Book of Matt, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard. Now, he landed himself in a lot of hot water because he told the truth. And many articles were written saying, I'm not even going to read this because it doesn't matter anymore. You know, it doesn't matter what the truth is. It's all about how we feel, where we heard this kind of a theory before. And George Floyd's story reminds you, we don't care if the truth is, we've already settled on the narrative. Don't let their truth get in the way of a good emotional time. What's interesting about Jimenez is that he had no intention of causing any controversy. He actually was an award-winning writer and TV producer. He visited Laramie shortly after the murder because he was going to write a screenplay about the case because he too felt so emotionally motivated by what took place. When he started out, he was convinced that this was a story about homophobia, but he soon found, as often can be the circumstance when you pursue truth rather than narrative, that this, there was much more to the story. In fact, this story had little to nothing to do with the fact that Matthew Shepard happened to be a homosexual. Here's what he found out. He found out that Matthew was addicted to and dealing crystal meth and had dabbled in heroin. He also took significant sexual risks and he was being pimped 
alongside Aaron McKinney. Now, why is that interesting to know? Because Aaron McKinney, if you remember what I mentioned earlier, was actually one of his convicted killers. So Matthew Shepard was being pimped as a prostitute alongside one of his killers who he had occasional sexual encounters with. How's that for a homophobic story? You're telling me that he was having sex with one of his killers and we're supposed to believe that this crime was motivated purely by homophobia? That doesn't add up. It is also a fact that Matthew Shepard was HIV positive at the time of his death. Speaking about this, Jimenez says, this does not make the perfect poster boy for the gay rights movement, which is a big part of the reason why my book has been so trashed. Matthew's drug abuse and the fact that he knew one of his killers prior to the attack was never even explored in court. Again, the narrative had been decided. You can picture Derek Chauvin's trial. It doesn't matter. We've got our guy, and we say that he hates the gays. They also didn't explore the rumor that the killers knew that he had access to a shipment of crystal meth with a street value of $10,000, which they wanted to steal. Now, if, you had, if I'd known this information, obviously, it would have tremendously colored my opinion on this circumstance, being someone that is familiar with what happens when people are addicted to drugs. I've spoken openly about the fact that I have drug addicts in my family, and I know what it does. There's nothing that you won't do to stop the high while you, to, to stop getting high. While you are high, the crimes that people commit, suddenly, is, was this a drug deal gone wrong? What are we actually talking about? What element of this? Why would another person that was engaging in homosexual relations kill somebody simply because they were gay? Were they motivated by something else? Looking back into Matthew's story himself, he was actually from an affluent family. He grew up in parts of his career, uh, parts of his childhood in Saudi Arabia. He was a straight A student when he got back and enrolled at Laramie. He spoke three languages. He had aspirations to be a human rights advocate. And then somewhere along the lines, he got into drugs. It's the truth. He was a drug addict. And then he became a prostitute who dabbled in danger, likely because he was looking for the next high. He suffered bouts of depression, possibly as a result of being gang raped a few years earlier while he was on holiday in Morocco. But this is not the story of the Matthew Shepard that was brought to the public eye as a symbol, a celebrated figure, rather, of the gay rights movement. So they went with their story of a honky-dory town in the middle of America that wanted him dead. Here's another interesting element of the story that was not made clear to me when I was in high school. After Matthew was left tied to that fence by McKinney and Henderson, they then headed for Matthew's home, okay? But on the way back to his home, they encountered two young Hispanic men named Emiliano Morales and Jeremy Herrera who were just slashing tires for sun, for fun. McKinney and Henderson got into a fight with these men, resulting in McKinney cracking open Morales' head with the same gun that he had used on Matthew. The police officer, Flint, when police officer Flint Waters arrived to the scene and grabbed Henderson, and he found the truck, the gun, Matthew's shoes, and his credit card. Now, what's interesting about that is that police officer then spoke with Jimenez about his book, and he wrote this on social media. I believe to this day that McKinney and Henderson were trying to find Matthew's house so they could steal his drugs. It was fair, fairly well known in the Laramie community that McKinney wouldn't be the one that was striking out of a sense of homophobia. Some of the officers I worked with had caught him, that's the convicted killer, in a sexual act with another man, so it just didn't fit. None of that made any sense. So yeah, when you look at the facts of this case, it would seem that they simply wanted his drugs. They understood he had a shipment coming and maybe the shipment had arrived and they killed him and they left him chained to a fence because they were going to get that shipment. They were going to make that $10,000. But as I said, we don't let facts get in the way of a good emotional time in America, especially when we can further our own causes. And this, this particular cause was tremendously impactful in my own life. So I look at that and I'm floored. I am floored by just the recognition of how easily brainwashed we are by our emotions and how the media, who we believe are committed to telling us the truth, will intentionally remove the truth from a story and sell us a lie. It is the reason why I produced my documentary, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold. 
I am amazed by the condition of brainwashing, especially when it seeps into adult minds. At least I was in high school when I believed this. At least I was having a mind molded and shaped for me by the public school system. What about people when you can freely pursue information on your own? When they hear a story, they believe the media, and they go out and they protest and they riot absent any facts. What's going on in those particular circumstances? I want to continue to explore that narrative, which is why in order to pivot and tell you guys, I am so excited, obviously, about my next, actually my first docu-series coming out, 10 full episodes convicting a murderer, the story of Stephen Avery, a man that the media, Netflix in part, tried to convince audiences all around the world could potentially be innocent. A man that is a convicted murderer who has fiancés and girlfriends in prison because of the power of the mainstream media, the power of the Netflix network to make people believe in the possibility of innocence because his innocence because, well, we hate police officers, so it's better for us to believe a plot line that police officers are just up to no good. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited to present to you guys the trailer for Convicting a Murderer. Take a look. This is a collect call from uh, Steve. an inmate at the Calumet County Jail. The man served 18 years in prison until DNA evidence cleared his name. The Two Rivers man was convicted of sexual assault in 1985, but exonerated with DNA evidence in 2003. So this is the infamous Avery Lott. Now, two years later, he again finds himself tied to a police investigation. Accused of murdering Teresa Holbuck on the Avery property. Stephen Avery's 16-year-old nephew admitted his involvement in the rape and murder of Teresa Holbuck. The car is discovered just around the bend. It was just this worldwide phenomenon. I think they framed this guy. I think he intended to crush the vehicle, but ran out of time. Avery thinks the $36 million lawsuit he filed is why he's being targeted in this investigation. 1021 at 24 Main Street. Uh, do we have Stephen Avery in custody? Netflix made millions of dollars from making a murderer, but the filmmakers left out very important details. Mountains of evidence that you have not yet seen. The blood vial. The most egregious manipulation from the movie. Interrogations. That's when he started beating me because I told him that he's sick. Cell phones. And I saw melted plastic parts of a cell phone. Interviews. Her arms were pinned behind her head. They made Stephen Avery look like a victim. Do you believe your brother is guilty? I don't know if I'm a suspect. I got on the hide. I'm getting sick and tired of media deception evidence piling up. Why would they omit so many different things? Why are you editing my testimony? I am not going to make the same mistake that the filmmakers did. Rearranging the testimony, they delete a portion of it at the end. How could they claim to care about the truth? They all know that Stephen Avery committed this crime. The evidence forces me to conclude that you are the most dangerous individual ever to set foot in this courtroom. So what do you guys think? Is this just a circumstance where you have an innocent man that was framed by the police officers? Or do you have a willing to believe anything audience that was potentially manipulated by Netflix? This can't be both. It's going to be one or the other. You guys, the 10-part series is exclusive at Daily Wire Plus, so join now at dailywire.com slash subscribe to get 25% off your new annual membership so that you can watch Convicting a Murderer when it premieres. I'm so excited about it. I think it's going to be a smash hit. I know true crime junkies like me are going to just absolutely love it, and believe me, you are going to be shocked when you really recognize the power of the media to make us believe anything, and myself included, obviously. And that's all I have to say about that. When you have an important meeting, you do it behind closed doors, right? You don't live stream it for the world. So why would you let people look in on you when you go online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like inviting the entire world into all of your meetings. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website that you visited? And what's worse is that they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you? ExpressVPN puts a stop to all of this. It creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity cannot be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all of my devices. It works on everything from phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they don't have ExpressVPN. And the best part is this. 
Using ExpressVPN is easy. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by Mashable, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like me and you believe that your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash Candice. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Candice to get three months free. Visit expressvpn.com slash Candice to learn more. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. So what do we have? Well, we have the first Republican debates tonight, which I'm super excited about because I'm going to be there. Yup, I am flying up to Milwaukee, going to watch it. I'm just amazed that I'm even in a position where I would be invited to watch the Republican debates. I've never seen a presidential debate, so this feels like a very fun life experience for me. What are we looking out for? Well, first and foremost, a poll came out and now it's been confirmed that DeSantis and Ramaswamy are now tied, which was something that people did not think plausible when Ramaswamy first rolled out his campaign. I remember I had Vivek on early because I thought he was just interesting. He was obviously not being backed by the establishment. He had no money behind him and everybody had their eggs in the basket. It was like Trump versus DeSantis. Nobody even thought about any other candidates. And I just thought that he might catch a little bit of fire. Turns out I am right. An Emerson College poll shows DeSantis and Ramaswamy tied at 10% support each, both of them far trailing uh, President Trump, who leads with 56% support, by the way, I should say. But it's interesting to take a look at this because DeSantis registered a huge drop. He was at 21% back in June, whereas Ramaswamy is rising. He was at just 2% back in June. So what is going on? Well, people really hated me when I told you the truth about DeSantis. I told you that it did not matter how much money the donors put behind any individual. If, if, if donors could win campaigns, right, if it was all about the donor money, we would have had Hillary Clinton for president in 2016. That's the truth. But she had a personality problem. She was not personable. Everything she ever said felt like a lie. And I'm not saying that because she's a Democrat. In the very same breath, I acknowledge Bill Clinton is very likable. Even though I know he's awful, he's very likable. When he talks, when he's doing things, you're like, oh, I kind of like this guy, right? Obama, very good talker. Even when he lies and he says nothing, it sounds like he's saying something important. That's what we're talking about. It's the it factor that certain candidates have, and Trump just has it, right? There's something about Trump that when you see him dealing with people, he has a way of communicating like a blue-collar worker. You, you, you don't feel like he's above you, that he's better than you. He's in on the jokes about himself. It, it is a talent that I can't even express. I, don't, I actually don't even know how to articulate it. You, it's just when you see it, when you meet him, when you're sitting across from him, whether you're at an event, you're just, he has a way of being able to connect with individuals. And DeSantis did not have this. And he thought that if he launched with an influencer network, people that have got millions of followers, bashing everybody over the head for having a different thought, insulting people online. He thought that if he, you know, had millions upon millions of dollars and donors with him, that he was going to be fine. He thought if his wife dressed like she was Jackie O back from the dead, then surely people would realize she's already the first lady. What it actually ended up reading as was really unnatural and really inauthentic. And he's had this problem long before he ran for president, by the way. It's the reason why Andrew Gillum almost bested him. He barely won that gubernatorial race. Let's not forget that. Um, and had it not been, ironically, for Trump, he probably wouldn't have made it over the finish line. and We would have had an Andrew Gillum for governor, which is a really scary thought because he was, he was a committed socialist. But Andrew Gillum knew how to move a room. And DeSantis is just unable to do that. I'm not even quite sure that DeSantis likes people per se. I think he is a, an effective governor and he works in office, but getting him into office was going to be a very steep climb. And I think that a lot of Trump supporters are feeling that the way that he has disrespected Trump has not been right. But worse than that is how his campaign has disrespected Trump supporters. They have allowed a minority of Trump supporters who they are upset with to be the who they are answering. They, they are constantly saying horrible things about Trump supporters online and sort of castigating everybody for what they view to be the crimes of the few. And I do think that there is an element, if I'm being honest with DeSantis, that resents Trump supporters. I think he does think that they are a little redneck and backwards and middle of America. 
And let me tell you, they are middle of America. A lot of them are proud rednecks, and that is something that he doesn't get. It just doesn't make sense to him and his campaign. So there has always been this disconnect. I My predictions for tonight, just to give them to you, is that Vivek is going to do unbelievably because I, I think he thrives in an academic environment. He doesn't struggle to connect with people. Um, he is complimentary. Even when he is saying something not to credit another candidate, he is complimentary. And obviously he is now being helped out by the fact that there was a memo that was recently leaked talking about how inauthentic uh, he seems, how inauthentic Pardon DeSantis seems. There was a memo that was leaked from the DeSantis Super PAC uh, supporting his candidacy, never back down, urging DeSantis to, at the debates tonight, take a sledgehammer to Ramaswamy. They didn't see him coming. They were so focused on Trump. And they even came up with terms and that he should use on stage, calling the fake the fake, right? So uh, just think about a bunch of donors sitting around being like, how can we take him down? I mean, how inauthentic is this? When Trump was coming up with names for all these candidates, it was just coming out of his own mouth. Lion Ted, you know, whatever he was saying. It was just Trump being Trump, but it was authentic. Well, when you have to have a donor sit down and come up with a phrase like the fake the fake, say it on stage— you just seem like a robot, you know? You're going to attack him now because they're telling you to, not because you want them to, but not because you personally maybe want to attack him, but because you're being compelled to do it. And now, of course, if he uses that term on stage, the biggest fake in the room will be Ron DeSantis. So he's best to just stick to doing what he does best, which I think is talking about his policies. I say all of this, not because I hate DeSantis. I've just been trying to be honest with you about what I am reading culturally, how I've been reading the room. Sometimes it gets me in trouble with DeSantis supporters. Sometimes it gets me in trouble with Ramaswamy supporters. Sometimes it gets in trouble with Trump supporters when I say that what Trump is going to suffer from now is that in 2020, Trump was gaining a ton of supporters. Now, Trump is still Trump. He's, like I said, leading at 56%, but he's not gaining supporters like he was in 2020. He's losing some. Some are going to DeSantis. Some are going to Ramaswamy. Some are tired of him and his antics. So he's going to have to figure out how to correct that, how to bring the party together. If he secures the nomination, how are you going to get people not to feel Trump fatigue and to still want to vote for you again? So though that is what I'll be looking out for tonight. I'm going to be very excited to be there. The show, by the way, just to give you guys a heads up, might be a little late tomorrow because by the time I get back, because flight are not fun out to Milwaukee. We'll probably be filming a little bit late, but um, anyways, that's what's on my radar. I want to hear from you guys, by the way. You know, we had Vivek on to answer some of your big pharma questions. You guys seem to have responded well. Um, we, by the way, did offer to have a Santa on the show. He did not come on. So people that are saying to me, oh, you're supporting one candidate. Nope. I also went out to RFK Jr. I will never vote for RFK Jr., but I think he's really interesting, and I think he's good for the national conversation. I just want to speak to candidates. I want to get them in front of the American people so that the American people can get a sense of who these people are. Why do you, you don't need to wait to be on a debate stage. Go talk to everybody. That's what you should be doing. Actually campaign. By the way, why is Vivek doing so well? Because he's hustling the hardest. There's no question that if every candidate in the field, nobody is doing more media hits, nobody is hitting the ground more, nobody is hitting podcasts, obscure podcasts, some I haven't even heard of, just trying to get his name out there more than Vivek. So he is, I will say, outworking his opponents. And his uh, tremendous jump going from 2 to 10% since June is, is largely due to his own work ethic. The Bible is the root of wisdom, inspiration, and spiritual nourishment. The Halo app empowers you to explore the Bible's profound teachings and effortlessly incorporate them into your daily life. A great place to start while you deepen your understanding of the Bible is to check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, available on the Halo app for brief daily readings and reflections. Here you can dive into an extensive library of Bible reading plans accompanied by insightful reflections and audio-guided meditations. Whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or just starting your journey, Halo provides a platform for you to engage with Scripture like never before. Studying the Bible's literary brilliance has influenced countless writers, poets, and artists throughout history. By studying the Bible, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the power of storytelling, symbolism, and metaphor, enriching your understanding of literature across different genres. The Halo app also helps you connect with a community of like-minded individuals, sharing experiences, insights, and encouragement along the path to spiritual growth. So download the app for free at halo.com slash Candice for three months free. That's halo.com slash Candice. All right, guys, speaking of which, it's time to jump into some of your comments. And as I mentioned, we had on DC Drano, that's his online moniker. His name is actually Rogan O'Hanley, and he's a friend of mine, and he is an avid Trump supporter. Come on to the show because he was taking hits. Um, he was, I'm sorry, throwing some shots at Vivek, and I love DC Drano. So I was like, dude, come on the show and ask him these questions up front. I don't know the answer to these questions. I don't want people to think that I'm trying to provide cover for him. And he did that. Here were some of your questions and comments, rather, um, regarding that episode. 
Jamie Padgett wrote, holy crap, thank you so much, Candace. I was on the Vivek train until he said he saw no ballot fraud. This was a must see. Glad to see Vivek admits what he doesn't know and is open for discussion. Great work, Candace. Yeah, I think I really appreciate when Vivek said, we don't have to agree, but let's disagree sincerely, you know, which is to say that I have said that I, I don't know anything about this. I'm happy to learn about it and to answer it. And I said, you know, I definitely believe that there was fraud and DC agreed that there was fraud. But I do believe that Vivek perhaps was, is, was not reading um, the same reports that DC Jano and I were reading because as DC Jano admitted, that person was kicked off of Twitter. The person that was doing the most work exposing all of that was eventually kicked off of Twitter before Elon Musk took it over. So that was, I thought, a very good answer and fair. Let's give people time to learn everything. Let's not make the assumption that everyone knows exactly what you know, because they don't. I don't. I didn't even know some things, and I learned them with time. Chase writes, as a current independent prior Democrat who voted for Trump twice, I really like Vivek. He is not about slamming others. He is about our country. It's so nice to hear someone who is positive, focused on on issues and policy and is logical in his points. Suburban, single mom. Yes, I think there are a lot of moms who are responding well to Vivek uh, because he seems to really stand up and fight for what it what he believes in, but he does it in a way that is very palatable, I would say, um, where he doesn't find it necessary to nece- like to, to throw pot shots. And I, I think it really serves him that he is so respectful to Trump and all that Trump accomplished and all that Trump has been facing for simply being outside of the DC swamp. Joyful Realtor writes, I love that Vivek is not running as an Indian American. He is running as an American. Yes, I would have not even entertained if he was saying, oh, by the way, reminding you guys, I'm brown, I'm an Indian. It's like, don't care. What are your ideas? And lastly, on TC6294 writes, voted Trump twice. Now I'm for Vivek 100%. He's who this country needs. I think his policy proposals are exactly what will move us forward. Great commentary. I'm, I'm always willing to have him back on the show. And also, I will openly say if there's another presidential candidate who would like to be given a platform to talk about their ideas, please, right? You guys just tell me. But I, I will have you on the show. As I've said, I've been out to many of them. Vivek just is hungrier right now, it seems. And I think that that is what people are seeing and responding to. Next set of comments are regarding the most racist person I have seen in my entire life. That teacher, remember that young woman, who saw a white arm on her sister and proceeded to have a Britney Spears level mental breakdown. Travis writes, the worst part about this is that she will still consider herself a victim somehow. Yeah, maybe, or she has just really ruined her own life and is going to have a lot of regrets. I actually wanna believe the latter. I think that she needed something this drastic to happen in order to transform her. I think she will be so shy um, and I don't think she's going to become further committed in her racism because what she did was so desp- despicable that there are, it's not like the black community is hailing her and going, you go, girl. It, I mean, it was just weird. It was like, how can you hate a white arm? It wasn't it was a figment. It was just like an arm. And she just was like, forget my job. Done. Hate these people. Maybe her boyfriend will think she's cool. Ella writes, she didn't think anything would happen from this. Quite frankly, I am surprised that something has happened. Now that it has, we will see the craziest of people come out of the woodwork to cry out for the injustice to her. And she will become another icon that separates us more. Please, Americans, stop the madness of racism. And yes, I mean all racism. I I hope you're wrong, and I hope I'm right. I think, actually, people were equally disgusted by it. I didn't see many people making videos in support of what she did. I didn't see any people making videos in support of what she did. I think it was, it was just really horrifically racist. And it's kind of one of those videos that even if you are one of these pro-black activists, as you as some people refer to themselves as, that you kind of had to take a step back and go, what exactly are we doing here? Because this ain't it. They wanted to distance themselves from that because it did seem that she was in a mania of sorts. Lastly, a comment from Betty Sims. She writes, after teaching for 20 years, my students saw my Facebook page and saw that I was a Trump supporter and pro-life. They reported me to the school district and I was immediately fired because they assumed that I must be a racist. Then they went after my license. The assistant district attorney stated to me that as a teacher, I do not have freedom of speech. My principal openly posted her liberal views and hatred for Trump, including profanity, but that was okay. I am now at a Christian conservative school and extremely happy. I might urge you to also try your circumstances in the court system because it doesn't actually work that you can have a principal that is allowed to have freedom of speech and then have a teacher that is not allowed to have freedom of speech. I would imagine that the 
courts will uphold your rights for freedom of speech. You are allowed to vote for who you want to vote for. And you can't just say that an individual is racist because they want to vote for Trump. So if you wanted to take that up the legal chain, I am sure that there will be a lot of organizations that will be willing and ready to assist you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time that we have for today. As a reminder, A Shot in the Dark is available now on Daily Wire Plus. So be sure to click the link in the description and subscribe right now. And also be sure to come back tomorrow because there'll be a brand new episode Granted, it might be a little bit late because I will be at the debates, and they're so late. I don't stay up that late. So you might see me in the audience sleeping a little bit, but hopefully I will have a lot of coffee. See you guys tomorrow.